Hey guys, and welcome back to Angel Education YouTube channel. In today's video, uh, we have as our guest, Niels, who is here to talk about how to get into Oxford University for engineering. Niels, thanks for joining us. Hey Sonny, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Niels. Uh, I graduated um, from my Master of Engineering in Material Science in 2018. Um, and we're gonna discuss all things engineering. Cool, all right. <laughs> Cool guys, so uh, in this video, you're gonna learn not everything, but most things you need to prepare a competitive Oxford application for engineering. And uh, if you stick stick with us for the whole video right at the end, Niels is gonna share his three tips for how to maximize your chances of getting for engineering. All right, Niels, so first of all, uh, engineering, you know, famous subject, lots of people, you know, thousands of applicants every year, lots of universities do it. Um, why, why should somebody consider um, Oxford uh, you know, Oxford or Cambridge for, you know, for engineering? So I think um, with Oxford and Cambridge engineering is they do have amazing departments um, and the teaching within Oxford and Cambridge is a very specific type. Um, so the way that teaching works at Oxford and Cambridge is you have your lectures, which is your whole year group um, of however many there are in your uh, year. And then you have your college learning which is inside your college, you have a specific engineering tutor and they do your tutorials, which are um, two students to one tutor who is a world-class engineering um, professor usually. Um, and you get that teaching two students to one. So you get that really, really intimate and sometimes grilling. It, the tutorials aren't always uh, your best friend, um, mm -hmm. but they are super, they're an amazing way of learning. You get that really, um, individual learning they know how you work they follow your development so you get a really great um style of learning and that's specific to oxford and cambridge to get that mm. and i think from you know from my experience and and, and talking to friends at other universities when i was a student and obviously nj students um oxford terms are just eight weeks so you have three terms of eight weeks which is 24 weeks of learning a year which means you have 28 weeks yeah, 28 weeks to do, you know, whatever else you want to do, right? Get a job, study, holiday, etc. So um, it's super intense for that time, but you actually have a lot of free time to pursue other projects and, and, and look at other things, uh, which, um, which you don't necessarily get at other, other universities. Yeah, it's a real work hard, play hard situation. Um, because as you say, you have these eight week terms, which seem compared to school, really short, but they really pack in the work. It really is intensive. Um, I won't sort of give a sort of illusion that it's lovely and you have loads of fun. We do have loads of fun, but you have to put in a lot of work. Uh, you can't just sail through. Um, so you have to make a decision to really want to go to Oxford or Cambridge to put that work in. But as you say, you get these short intensive turns, but then you do have a lot of time, which can be to go off traveling or as an engineer can be to go into an engineering firm get some work experience, put yourself out there into the world to see what kind of avenues you want to go into. Mm. Maybe it might not be engineering, it might be going into um, work experience in the city or in um, completely different environment that you just want to get more exposure to. Yeah, you know, from memory, you, you, you use that time, well, even during term time, but certainly outside to pursue, you know, passion in acting and drama, if, uh, you know, if I'm correct. So, you know, being at Oxford gives you that opportunity to, to pursue those projects. Yeah, exactly. Um, because everyone's so focused in those times, with the spare time you do have, everyone makes the most of it. We have like amazing sports, there's amazing drama, there's so much going on um, that if, if you want to get involved in anything, then you can. And people have that sort of attitude of go getting and doing things. That applies to our academics, but also the extracurricular. Mm, definitely. Um, okay, so if we just Pivot, pivot back to engineering. So, you know, what, what is the timeline? Um, you know, when do you when do you apply? How do you apply? And how does it work? Yeah, so applying to Oxford and Cambridge, it's important to know that your UCAS deadline is earlier than the general UCAS deadline. Um, so it's around 15th of October. Um, it may change a couple of days year on year. So make sure you uh, know when that is. But for that, that is when you will have to uh, submit your personal statement. Um, so you submit it for that deadline. And then the thing we're looking at is you'll have to do some form of admissions test, and then you go to invite to interview if you're lucky. Um, and then you'll get an offer 
um, after that. Okay, great. So you applied by 15th of October. Are there any tests that you need to do as part of the engineering application? Yeah, so applying for Oxford, you have to do the um, physics aptitude test. Um, and this is something that um, everyone does um, after you've applied, you don't get selected to do it. Um, every applicant for all the different subjects that take the PAT test, it's not just engineering, it's physics and material science mm -hmm. and some other subjects that do it. Everyone sits on the same day. Um, and with the Cambridge one, you do um, your ENGA, the engineering aptitude test, which is specific for your engineering. Um, and everyone sits this test on the same day. Um, now this test is an aptitude test, not necessarily a knowledge test. So it's showing your aptitude for the subject. So it's not always about getting full correct 100%. You won't get 100%. These tests are hard tests. Yeah. It's about showing the way you think, your thought process. Go, you may only do half a question. You may get through just writing down a formula. You might not get to a solution. Um, you might have to make up a formula. If you're not familiar with the topic, let's go, okay, I'm not sure. Let's make up this formula, but make a note and say, mm. I've uh, created this formula with a given um, coefficient for how I've got the equation wrong um, and work through that. So it's about applying your knowledge um, that you have from your A-level subjects and about showing how you can apply that to the different questions that you've been given. No, no, that's right. And um, Niels, what, what would your advice be? So let's say, you know, you're there, you're under time pressure, you know, you have maybe a couple of questions left and, and you sort of, you, you, you can do have a question and maybe you can, you don't remember the formula exactly. So would you still recommend tackling those, um, those questions if you can offer it a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So if you can't remember the formula, don't worry. As I say, it's not necessarily just a memory test about these equations. If you can't um, remember the equation, make one up. As I say, put it in, just say this, and then plug in the numbers to show that you can at least do the sort of working out bit. Um, so, and write a little note to say, I've made this up. And they'll go, actually, this person's shown that initiative to, rather than just going, oh no, I don't know the equation, I can't do that question. They've gone, actually, no, I'm gonna approach it in a positive way rather than a negative way. Similarly, if you can't approach the first part of a question, but you know how to do the second part, um, you can say, okay, I would, if I was able, I would get this first part and I would get a value out for voltage, say, and then you apply it to the second part and you can get the power out. So you show, write down the method that you would take, even though you can't remember the exact equations. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, I remember you sharing this story from your finals and just a flashback to my finals. Um, I remember I looked at, and on the right page of the notes in the morning, but I just couldn't remember this formula. And I just said, look, it's on page 53 of the, you know, of the, uh, you know, of these lecture notes, you basically just do this, this, and, and, and you know, how you get to an answer. And anyway, I, I don't know whether that worked. I never requested my transcripts back, but if you can put something in, right, and just explain the basic concepts to show that you really know it and it's just the, the formula, they'll give you at least something. Something is better than nothing on the PAT test, always. No, definitely. Um, that and the same would apply to the, um, to the anger, yeah. Yep. Okay, so you've done those, so you apply around 15th of October, then you have those tests, normally late October, early November, and then you find out normally around late November whether you're invited to an interview, assuming you are, when will the interviews take place? So the interviews kind of take place the beginning of December. Um, so it varies year on year about when the Oxford term ends, because they happen just after the Oxford term has finished. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll all be there at the same time. So all applicants or majority of applicants will be there at a similar time. Yeah. Okay. So you have the interviews. And um, is, it, is it still true that most applicants will get more than one interview with different, different academics? Yeah, that's usually true. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but usually you'll have... Um, a, an interview at your chosen college. So we haven't really discussed what the colleges mean, but you apply to a given college when you apply to Oxford. Um, just a piece of advice on this, don't stress too much about your application to the college. At the end of the day, most of the colleges are very similar. Um, it may be that the only difference is really that, okay, one looks slightly old and one looks slightly new. Um, the tutors that are at all of them are all world-class engineering tutors. Um, their styles may vary slightly, but I would say, don't stress too much about that. Mm. It doesn't, your decision may not be up to you. You may go to one college, 
you have your interview there. As you were saying, you might get a second interview. Another college may then say, actually, we want an interview with you. So you have to go to a different college that you didn't apply to at all. And you may end up getting into that college. Um, so college choice, it doesn't have to be a, a yes, it is important because it's where you will be doing your subject, but it's not 100% confirmed that that's where you will be. No. And, um, and also, if, you, you know, if you're watching this from overseas and, and you're an international applicant, first of all, just because you don't have A-levels or you know, the IB, there are a ton of qualifications that Oxford and Cambridge will accept. So do check the, uh, you know, the pages for international qualifications and we'll put them in the, in the description of this video below. Um, but also, um, you know, do reach out. You know, it costs you nothing apart from a little bit of your time to um, each department has a schools liaison officer and their job, I mean, they're, you know, they're paid to answer to emails from prospective applicants from the UK and throughout, throughout the world. So if you have a question or a particular worry, or maybe there is a, a set of circumstances, you know, it can be disability, can be uh, a bereavement, can be maybe you missed out on school for circumstances beyond your control. R reach out in advance um, and make it known and say, look, these, these are my circumstances. Can I still apply? In the majority of cases, they'll say, of course, you can apply. And they'll actually let the tutors know, you know, of your background and of your circumstances. So the system fundamentally tutors, whether it's Oxford for engineering or Cambridge for engineering, what they're interested in is finding the most qualified, not the most qualified, the students with the most potential, right? And, and you find potential everywhere. And someone had a, you know, a stable family, you know, great school, great schooling and, you know, happy life. That's fantastic. And there are some really talented people there. Others had different set of circumstances, right? So, um, and they want to work and, and they do genuinely work really hard to find talent wherever it comes from. So if you've had, you know, maybe you weren't able to do further maths at school and you're thinking, oh no, everyone's got, you know, further maths, um, uh, but actually it's not required. You know, maths is normally sufficient. So um, do not be afraid. And probably the worst thing you can do is not apply. Um, at least, um, you know, you're definitely going to get rejected then. Yeah, I completely agree with all of that. Uh, cool. Okay, so um, Niels, just as we're wrapping up this video, you got to the interview stage. Uh, you're there. What actually do they ask at interviews, and how do you how do you answer the um, the questions? Because you hear so many horror stories. Yeah. So first of all, just to start with this, uh, talking about interviews, is that you do hear these kind of horror stories of horrible interview questions. But actually, to start off with, the interviewers want you to do well. They're not there to trick you or to catch you out. They, they want you to do well. They want you to show your potential. So um, go in with that attitude of they want me to do well, so I, I want me to do well. So that's a really key thing to note when going into them. Um, but what they will ask you, um, it's, it depends on college to college, but you could be, get given as an intro, some kind of math starters. So sketch this curve, do some differentiation, just to show that kind of base level of maths to show that you've got that there. They could then present you with some kind of engineering problem. A challenge. Let's say they present you with um, some kind of renewable energy issue. You may have to present a solution of sort of what your initial ideas of how you can present an engineering solution to this problem, working out um, the feasibility of this. Because um, as an engineer, we have to think about all different factors when we design something. So we could be dealing with design factors of something, or we could be dealing with a, a more um sort of academic style question where they go okay here's a set of resistors um can you work out the um, power output from this set of resistors um that we've got so it can be linked to a more sort of physics style question it could be a, maybe a more open-ended design sort of concept factors discussing question could be a mathematical basic question they've got there um it really sort of depends on uh which interview so it's not sort of a hard and fast rule of what they will give you. They could give you um, a piece of um, sort of an article which discusses maybe a new engineering technique. And then you go into the interview, they might give you that before you go into the interview and they discuss this new technique and you have to discuss with them having an academic conversation. Yeah, and um, I think um, at least in, in my experience and experience of our students, it's, it's a thing I will say, if you don't know something, it's okay to say that you don't know and ask for help, right? Because for example, some students uh, pursuing further maths A-level would have had lots of mechanics, um, you know, 
um, as part of the uh, as part of their curriculum. Others studying the IB or maybe international qualifications, um, you know, have never seen it. So if they give you, for example, in you know my interviews at uh, at my second interview for material science, but you know which is similar, I had a problem to do with mechanics and some pulleys, and, and you know the gra gravity was sort of turned upside down. And um, now I've done mechanics, and I and I sort of I was able to you know to get to the bottom of that question, um, but some applicants would have never seen it. And it's okay to say, sorry, you know, Professor X, whatever, um, I've never done mechanics. However, you know, let me just attempt this anyway. And, you know, with your help. So it's, it's okay. I find that they quite like people who are genuine. So if you don't pretend to know it all, because you don't, um, that can almost work in your favor. I don't know. Have you, uh, what's yeah, your experience? Completely. Um, they want to get to the stuff that you don't really know. So if you get presented with, say, a graph sketch and you go, oh, OK, great, I know what that graph looks like, draw it. They're not interested in that. They want to know your process of working things out. So as you say, it's great to it's, it's, it's absolutely fine to say, I don't know how to do this, but I could think of an approach to start this way. They may go, OK, let's park that idea. What about starting about this approach? And it's about working with them to go through the problem, not about going, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Because they'll just move on to a next question yeah. until they know, until there's something that you don't know or you can't answer. Yeah, or, or for example, you know, in that particular example, they saw that the initial question I was quite easily able to answer. So then they said, okay, well, what about this now? And, and, and this second part was much harder. And this is when they got their, you know, this is when they kind of got their value for money out of me. Um, <laughs> you know, similarly, somebody who would have never seen any mechanics, they would have simplified it and they would have said, okay, well, forget about that. Let's just look at this, you know, what what's intuitive to you okay you know if gravity sort of you know pulls you up instead of down now so where would the um uh, i think it's called the resistance force the uh, um the reaction sorry the reaction force you know which direction it would be and again with the information they provide you and uh if you're well read which you should be um you're kind of putting yourself in a good position to answer that um so it's it's, it's always a good idea to read Lots, you don't have to read everything, but maybe if you read you know, a couple of books or watch some podcasts, uh, probably watching this video already sets you, you know, ahead of the game, you can prepare yourself for those type of questions and, and at least um, be able to approach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just on that kind of watching videos and podcasts and things, I often find myself just going down a loophole of, oh, I'll watch a video on some kind of engineering thing and another one will pop up and go, oh, okay, it's just, it's sort of five, 10 minutes out of your day just to watch a little video it may come in useful in a say a personal statement, it may not, but it's just sort of expanding your knowledge as an engineer. So just watching little things, even if they're not kind of super interested in them, going, oh, actually, I've never considered what a quantum computer is, or I've never considered how, um, I don't know, a wheel stays on the ground, uh, whatever it is, just a little video is going, oh, actually, that's quite interesting, or actually, and that stuff doesn't interest, interest me as much. It shows you, it develops your knowledge and your understanding. Yeah, and and I, and I would say um, lots of people, um, you know, myself included, especially when you get to Oxford, you have this imposter syndrome. You're thinking, okay, did I make a mistake? Like, you know, should I be here? But um, the the important thing to remember is that no one, no, no one's born a genius, or you know, this kind of, you know, there is no such thing as Oxbridge material, which people often say. You can become that material through your own hard work and through making sacrifices to your social life and maybe other things and and kind of being very disciplined with your time and expanding your horizons but it's not um at least i find there is no such thing as a as a candidate who's just destined to get in for engineering and others go not um, i don't know would you comment yeah completely agree on that and i think people get put off by thinking that um that oh no i'm not i'm not quite the right candidate but as you say there is no right candidate there's just a level of potential that you have and some people they may be further on with their sort of understanding and academics but that doesn't mean their potential is bigger than your potential no. just because you don't have that as much knowledge at the moment you might still have the potential for it yeah and you know for example in in engineering um lots of people would come to to oxford or cambridge with their a level and further maths many people will come without that a level and further maths right so and um for, for those without it the first few weeks there are extra classes extra lectures which uh, you know which means they have to work Harder and, and kind of those with that further maths, you know, I remember I came to Oxford, I did further maths when I arrived, by the time I arrived, I had that A level, I found those few weeks quite easy. And so, you know, I kind of took it fairly relaxed and I thought, well, great, I'm, you know, this is, this is great. This is, if, that, if that's what the university is going to be like, this is, this is chill. 
And then three weeks later, I was in for a shock because once those have caught up, you know, two years of further maths in, in about three weeks, then it became just hard for everybody, whether you have done further maths or, or, or have not. So it's, um, it, it's really equally hard on everyone. And, and whoever says it's not hard, they're lying. You know, they're probably in their room struggling, but they just kind of put on this facade that it's all easy. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Um, Niels, just as we are uh, finally wrapping this up, uh, what would your top three tips? So you're someone, you know, you're watching this as a teenager, 16, 15, you've decided on applying for engineering to Oxford or Cambridge. What would your tips be? So the first tip would be to kind of what I was saying about the videos is to just expand your horizons, to read things, to um, see articles, to watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts, just expand your horizon of what engineering, first of all, means um, and the different areas that are within engineering, because there are so many different topics of engineering and different universities you can apply for specific engineering courses. So just getting that um, exposure to all different topics and it doesn't have to be just engineering um, a lot of times people change their degree what they want to apply for I wanted to apply for natural sciences originally and then I went on to apply for um, material science mm. so you change what you get by reading and by exploring so the first piece of advice is just put yourself out there read things watch things listen to things by that I also don't mean you have to be reading a huge engineering book a week absolutely not watching a five minute YouTube video a week, equally as useful. So just get the exposure out there, I would say that. Um, and second of all is speak to others. So chat with friends, chat with parents, chat with, um, if you wanna get in contact with someone, a, um, a researcher or at a company, just have discussions. Even if they're not about engineering necessarily, they could be about other sciences or even the arts. Have those academic discussions because it gets you thinking in a slightly different way other than just watching something and absorbing it, but then trying to teach someone or then try to discuss with someone. That's a skill that really cements knowledge and gets you thinking in a slightly different way. So I'd say those two tips. And then the third tip um, that I would give um, is to not be too set on certain things. Mm -hmm. We can get very set on being, right, I have to get to Oxford and do engineering. And that is my absolute goal. And I would say that sometimes it can be a bit damaging to have those, to think, right, I have to do that. Because you don't know where you will end up. As we say, you could be an amazing candidate, what you think is Oxbridge material, but actually it doesn't quite work out. Your interview might go a little bit pear-shaped or it just wasn't meant to be. You, you yeah. weren't sort of meant to have it that time. Um, it doesn't mean that you're, you're less good as it, as it, as mm. it is. Um, so I would say, and it may be that you change your choice of what you want to do. You, maybe you decide, okay, actually engineering is not for me, or you want to do something else and now engineering is for you. So I would say keep an open mind on everything um, and approach everything with a sort of positive attitude rather than a sort of have to get their attitude. It's, uh, it's, it would be a great thing to go to Oxford to do engineering or Cambridge, but also it could be amazing to do I don't know, chemistry or it could be amazing to go to Imperial or wherever it is. So keep that open-mindedness throughout every stage of what you're, as your development. Yeah, definitely. And just perhaps a, you know, a bonus point and, you know, from me and just a more comment on your second point, um, talking to people, I find that people, especially in the engineering and the science community, in the, in the academic community, are actually very open and very welcoming to talking to strangers. Um, and all it takes is just an email, virtually all researchers, all academics, People who work at museums, all their emails are public information, uh, by and large. You can just send an email, right? And just say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm interested in this. Um, you know, can we speak? You know, do you have 10 minutes for a Skype call? Or, you know, do, you know, could I come in just learn more about your work? You will be surprised how open and welcoming people are because it's a community where everybody is passionate about the same thing, maybe different sub-things, but you know, broadly science and engineering. And People love to help other younger academics people in a different different stage of their journey. Um, and I remember I just called emailed somebody at the National Physics Laboratory in Teddington, um, sort of outer outer London, and um, and I was super surprised. The guy replied within thirty minutes and he said, "Yeah, why don't you come in? We we'll have this conference." 
And I went and I was like the youngest guy by 20, you know, by about 20 years. But they took me seriously. They showed me all the all the gear, all the toys they have. And, you know, you will be surprised how open people are to, to helping. Yeah, completely agree with that. And it just takes an email. And the worst thing that happens is you don't get a reply. Um, but as you say, people are always really open to doing things um, and putting yourself out there. Um, I remember a similar one. I went to um, a lecture at the Royal Institute. It was a, maybe their Christmas one or something. And at the end, I just um, approached the, the lecturer and I said, hi, I really loved something you were talking about. Would I mind, would you mind if I took your email? And then we had a little email correspondence. I chatted about some sort of concepts with her, um, which was super interesting. And you don't, so just putting yourself out there um, and emailing people there, more often than not, they'll be willing to do something. Definitely. Cool. All right, Niels, thanks so much for your time. And uh, guys, have you enjoyed this? Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and any questions about engineering admissions or your experiences, you know, write them in, in the comments and we'll try to answer as many as we can.